If you will, turn to the Gospel of John, to chapter 2, chapter 2, and we shall read verses 13 through 25, or at least part of it. We left Jesus last week with his mother and disciples and others in Capernaum, and now John immediately transitions over to Jerusalem. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was the temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover and the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. I think most of us, and rightly so, think of Jesus as gentle and a peace-loving person. However, we see him in this case not so gentle and not so peace-loving. I think it's terribly difficult for some people to see the Jesus who says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest in your souls. And then see Jesus doing as he did in cleansing the temple. And that's the focus of this lesson from John. Because it's obvious there were times when Jesus became angry. He was filled with righteous indignation. Now, we've said this at other times about anger. The Bible tells us how to regulate our anger. Our anger should not take us beyond thinking logically and being in control of ourselves. And it should not last. Let not the sun go down your anger, Paul said. But on this occasion, Jesus certainly, and this was at the beginning, of course, of his ministry, Remember, we just studied the first miracle he worked in Cana before he comes up to Jerusalem and does this. And here he drives the money changers and merchandisers out of the temple, verses 13 and 15. Now, I want you to think with me for a moment. Think with me for a moment. What would cause Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to have this outburst of anger? By what authority did Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, who loved us and gave himself for us, did he do this? And in answering those questions, what lessons may be derived from this event? Now, we read it. It's for our good. It's not just a historical record. It's for our own good spiritually. So we want to look at this and see if we can understand some of these, these lessons and make the proper application. For that's really what all preaching and study of the Bible is about. Now, understanding it, if we don't make the application, a lot of good that does. First of all, notice there's a rebuke here. A rebuke says, you know what's right, you're not doing it, and I'm getting on your case. That's what it amounts to. And our Lord's rebuke really is found the reason for his display of righteous indignation, which, of course, is a form of anger. Verse 16, take these things hence. Make not my father's house and house of merchandise. We have people selling oxen and sheep 
We have people who are money changers because whatever money you had from where you came from as a Jew, you had to change it into the temple money. And what had been done is they just really had there in the precincts of the temple uh, garage sale. <laughs> they just simply had turned it into a place to make money. They would lost all sight about what these things were all about. And Jesus recognized that. And according to Matthew's account, the temple, as I said, is to be, or as he said, a house of prayer. But they had turned it into a den of thieves, Matthew 21, 13. And when Matthew does that, you have turned it into a den of thieves, we understand the caliber of a lot of these people. They were not honest in their dealings. So clearly Jesus was angered by the way in which some used religion to make money. Now, people have always done this. You go back to the Roman Catholic times and the beginning of the Reformation in Europe and all the way back 100 years before that, they were selling all kinds of relics. And they did that to make money. Right over today in Rome, St. Peter's Cathedral and all of that was made throughout Europe by them selling all sorts of relics, such as pieces of the cross and all this kind of thing that they sold to an ignorant bunch and they bought it. And all that money was raised in that way. We today need to be mindful in our own personal activities in the church, but especially even if we're what we ought to be as Christians. What other people do sometimes to make merchandise of God's house, which is the church. What if we attend church also simply, as some have done, as a form of uh, networking to make business contacts or other things like that. Now you may say, I can't conceive of somebody doing that. Well, you need to get your conceiver working a little better because I promise you people can do all sorts of things along that line and, and they have. And that's not saying that brethren can't be friends with one another and help each other in certain things. But some people don't see the church in that way. And we need to be aware that we don't, first of all, and that we are aware that others do, and we need to be wary of them. What if we take advantage of our relationship as brethren to further some sort, as brethren have done, multi-level marketing business, some kind of home-based business, or some kind of financial enterprise? Now, these things within themselves may be not a thing to go wrong with it. You see, this is checking our motives. This is checking our purpose for what we do. And again, I will hasten to say that being brethren in the Lord, we certainly could help one another along that line. So we're not talking about an honest motive. We're not talking about that kind of thing. We're trying to, say, make the difference in people and be careful. The Lord's temple today, remember, is the church. It's a place to worship God. And we must be careful, because I only listed a couple of things here, lest we defile the temple of God or the church. And the brethren at Corinth, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, were warned about defiling the temple of God. Well, how do you do that? Don't live like the Bible says Christians are to live. Don't conduct the worship like the New Testament says it ought to be. All sorts of things like that. Just corrupt the doctrine that pertains to the church. And you're defiling the temple of God. Again, we hasten to say and to emphasize the temple of God today is the church. And the church is people. So we need to understand that. Now the Lord has ordained that those who give themselves full time to the gospel be supported. I think all of us understand that. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 14. But if Jesus was angry at the abuse of things and misuse of things under the law of Moses regarding the temple that was such an integral part of the Jews' worship, then would he not be very upset at the body of people he purchased with his blood? 
the church that he built, when we do not consider one another, as the Bible says we should, brothers and sisters in the Lord, citizens, fellow citizens of the kingdom of heaven, and how we deal with one another. We also notice that his anger, his righteous indignation, was prompted by what the Bible says is his zeal. Zeal for what? His zeal for the Lord. He was zealous of his father's house. His zeal reminded the disciples of the Old Testament prophecy we see in verse 17 found in Psalm 69.9. So when you're reading Psalm 69.9, then this is where that it was fulfilled. The zeal of mine house hath eaten me up. So let me ask you this. Since the church is God's house today, 1 Timothy 3.15, are we zealous for the church and all things that pertain to it? Are we zealous when it comes to the obligations God has laid upon the church that the church and the church only is to be doing? Preach the gospel to every creature. That's the church's responsibility. But now quickly remember, we're talking about the individual Christians who make up the church. We need to be zealous that the church fulfill its intended purpose, which is to make known the will of God. This is what Paul told the church in Ephesus in Ephesians 3, 10 through 11. Now that means each member, according to their several abilities, growth and develop in knowledge and practice of the truth, should be doing what they can to teach others. And certainly by our conduct and our dealings with one another and how we live in the home, we should show forth the truths of God pertaining to the same in our lives. That we are troubled when we see... Uh, when we see people, our brethren in particular, turn the church into something else, does it bother us? Uh, if it's just simply a social club and that's all that people think about it, or maybe just a purveyor of entertainment. And again, people say, well, can't we have fun with one another? Don't we eat together and all these different things that we do? I'm not against that. I'm all for that. But if we let that get into our minds as the chief thing the church is all about, and each member in particular, we've missed it because it's primarily a teaching institution. It's primarily one that is concerned about the brethren being faithful and doing what's necessary to make them faithful. It has to do with studying the Bible. It is to be full of people who care for God more than anything else on earth and who truly seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, because they know God will see them through this life with the things that they need. And they see one another in that light as brothers and sisters of the Lord. And if we have zeal for the Lord's house, then assuredly we will not be silent when others pervert its purpose. In other words, we will do our best to make the church pure. All you have to do is go back to the first sin in the church in Jerusalem. And you see how God uh, told us and tells us and keeps before us that he does not respect lies and brethren wanting to appear to be something they're not. And you say, well, that was then. That's not now. If they did it then, people would do it now. And thus, each one of us can see that. And if we're what we are, we will make sure our minds don't drift off into such things. That's why Paul constantly and other writers said, be sober-minded. See life for what it is and live like the Lord said. Be zealous. Fear God. Have the proper respect for God, the proper awe of God, and keep oneself in submission to His will. I guess you can say it like John did. Keep yourselves in the love of God. That is, be faithful unto death. The action we take certainly would not be the same that Jesus took. He took a whip of cords and drove animals and people out. Somebody said, you think he hit anybody with that? Well, the Lord never, <laughs> the Lord never did do anything like this except that he used it for what he made it for. Somebody says, well, he only drove out the animals by hitting them with that. Well, how do you know that? He is the Lord. 
and not many days if you look at it in the sense of years after the church is established I would think Ananias Sapphira would a lot better rather have been hit with cords hit with cords than what happened to them so by what authority did Jesus have to use such a display of force and of course that's what the Jews wanted to know and this gets us immediately into the authority of Jesus Christ on earth so they wanted to know what uh, sign or miracle he could offer to them to prove that he had a right to cleanse the temple, John 2 and verse 18. There's nothing wrong with him asking that question. If people in religion had that attitude, an honest attitude, of saying, all right, you're doing this as service to God, where is your authority from the New Testament of the Christ that this is acceptable? We don't tend to ask that question like we ought even in the church. If we would approach in our own mind as we work out whatever problem may arise, well, what does the Lord authorize about this? We always talk about he authorizes either explicitly in just so many words or implicitly, and he does so through implication, through direct statements, and the various kinds of direct statements and example. But when it comes down to dealing with a specific thing, is this acceptable to the Lord to do it this way, to engage in this? We seem to forget that we can determine whether it is or it is not by going through asking the question, is there a direct statement? Is there an example? Is it implied? And listen, if there's not a direct statement, whatever kind it may be, and if there is not an example that is a pattern, and if there's nothing implied, you don't have authority to act. We can use it easily by saying, where's the authority from God to use a mechanical instrument of music in the worship? Is there a direct statement? Is there an example? Is it implied? And that's what's involved rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. And Jesus said, if you continue in my words, then are you my disciples, a learner, follower, indeed, in your actions. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. If we know a document authorizes people in such a way to do this, that, or the other, and we can see where it's expressly forbidden, we know not to do that, then why can't we figure out what's acceptable to God and what's not? And when it takes the totality of the Bible's teaching in its immediate context and remote context on a given topic, and we've amassed all of that, then we can know the totality of God's will on that for us today and know what we ought to do or ought not do. If not, we would never would have arrived at the plan of salvation. And we sometimes don't realize people had to work through that once they adopted the Bible as the only rule of faith and practice. They had to determine that, well, you've got to hear the word. You've got to understand it. It's by that that we have faith, confidence, and trust in G that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And where do we get the idea that you must then repent of your sins? Why then, once upon that, does he con confess that Christ is the Son of God? And now he's qualified to be immersed in water by the authority of Christ for the remission of sins. That all comes from a careful understanding that you amass all of the information pertaining to the same, and then you reason with it and draw the conclusion. And you can't find that plan of salvation and any verse or two together. You have to glean it from the whole of the New Testament. <coughs> That's how we determine the authority of the Lord for whatever it is that we're dealing with. Now Jesus, in answer to them wanting to see a sign from him to prove his authority to do what he did in cleansing the temple, he simply offers his ability to rise from the dead as the ultimate proof, John 2, 19 through 22. Of course, they had no concept of somebody rising from the dead not to die anymore. There are cases in the Old Testament where people were raised from the dead, but they died again. Later, we learn over in John 10, 17 and 18 that he would restate his claim to this ability of raising himself from the dead. Now we learn from Romans 1, 4, Paul beginning his letter to the church at Rome, that his resurrection proved that he was the son of God. 
If it didn't prove that, what would it prove? He's been given the authority then to exercise judgment such as cleansing the temple because he is the Son of God. John 5, 22 and 26 through 27. Now we must recognize we do not have the same authority as Jesus did. We're to judge with righteous judgment John commands that Jesus actually did in John 7 verse 24 judge not according to appearance that's where I find a lot of people like to judge they like to make up their mind the way things look superficially but Jesus that's not the way you do it not if you want to do it right you judge righteous judgment. Well, what does that mean? Well, all of God's commandments are righteousness. Psalms 119, verse 174. It means we're letting the Word of God tell us whether this person is engaged in God's will or not. It doesn't even get into the motive of that person. When somebody tells me, well, I'm a Christian. I'm saved. Well, when did you obey the gospel? What do you mean by obey the gospel? You might try that on your denominational friends. They don't have a concept of obeying the gospel. All they ever hear is just believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and ask Him to come into your life and you're saved. All right, if you find out a person declaring they're a Christian, but that's all that person has done to become a Christian, what do you know about that person in view of what you know about the Bible? He may be as sincere as a person could be sincere, but he's not a Christian because he hasn't obeyed the gospel, God's power to save, Romans 1, 16. We're also uh, taught in Matthew 7 and verse 6 that we have to discern the difference between dogs and hogs. If you look at that, he says, don't give that which is holy to the dogs, don't. Cast your pearls before swine lest they trample them underfoot, turning in or end you. Well, my, my, the Son of God called people dogs and swine. Dogs and hogs. Peter did that too by the Holy Spirit writing to Christians when he talked about those that knew the truth, obeyed the truth, and lived it for a while and then left it. He said, you're like a dog and a hog. I said, but that's how the Holy Spirit saw it. You're like the dog that returned to his own vomit and the hog or the sow that was washed through a wallowing in the mire. Who's he talking about? The child of God that knew the truth, obeyed the truth, and was a Christian and quit living it. That's how God sees us. Now, we can make that discernment. If not, tell me what you get out of those words that were given for our learning when we read them. We can distinguish between good and bad fruit. By their fruits you shall know them, Matthew 7, 15 through 20. But that does not mean that I can, I, that I can uh, know the motive behind something. That person may reveal their motive. People have been known to reveal their motive. But I may not have it revealed, but I can tell by their actions whether those actions are in harmony with the Word of God or not. But our authority... Is limited. Matthew 7, 1 through 5. Judge not, they should be judged. The idea is we can't get into the judging motive business when we have no way to discern it. Somebody says, well, we worship correctly on the first day of the week. Well, we take the Lord's Supper once a quarter. Then you didn't worship correctly. I don't care how sincere you were, how much you wanted to do God's will. When you didn't worship in the assembly of the saints by partaking the Lord's Supper, your worship was not acceptable. That singular worship of the church on the first day of the week involves five avenues of worship. And I arrive at those five avenues the same way I arrived at each step of the plan of salvation. And we also see that we can't seek out our own vengeance. Romans 12, 17 through 19. Vengeance in particular belongs to the Lord. We need to understand that. It is true that Jesus is our pattern of life, our example to go by, 1 Peter 2, 21. But there are steps that he took we cannot, we don't have the ability, we cannot take. It's impossible. And the reason we can't emulate the Lord in every case becomes quite evident 
when we consider the very power of the Lord himself. That power justifies his action. John mentions how many came to believe in him because of his signs. John 2 and verse 23. And remember, when we started this thing on John, John chapter 20, 30 and 31 says that's why he recorded these miracles. They are to prove that he is the only begotten Son of God. John also makes note of his unwillingness to commit himself to others at that particular time. Why? Because he knew when was the exact time to do what he was going to do. He had no need to. He, he knew all John 2, 24. He had no need to because he knew what was in man that we just read, verse 25 of John 2. Jesus is revealed as one who can discern the hearts of men, Matthew 9, 4, and look at the, set of the, the letters to the church of Asia, and every one of them, Christ can write what he writes because I know what's up. You can't hide anything from God. It would do us well, no matter how faithful we are, to remember you hide nothing from God. Whatever you do, he knows. He knows what your motives are. He knows whether they're right motives in harmony with the Word of God or whether they're wrong motives. Because you can do a right thing from a wrong motive or else you wouldn't be instructed to worship God in spirit and in truth. You can be worshiping God in truth, but your heart's not in it. You can mouth the words of every song, but you're not thinking about what the song is saying. When we sing, oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His wondrous love, our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilion and splendor, and girded with praise. Now, what's going on in our minds when we sing those words? It better be what those words mean. Or you haven't worshipped Him in spirit, even though you worship Him in truth. And when the Lord's Supper's passed around, this do in remembrance, something's going on in your mind. In remembrance of me, it also implies they're taught about the Lord's Supper. Shows forth his death till he come again. To be done on the first day of the week, Acts 27. And thus we're going to be mindful of that bread. Representing the body of Christ. The sinless body of Christ. And the fruit of the vine representing the blood shed for the remission of our sins. All those things are involved. You see, you can't worship acceptably. And you can't live the Christian life if you don't know the truth. My people are destroyed, Hosea said, for lack of knowledge. So we don't have the same power that Jesus did. We cannot discern the hearts of men as the Lord can, did. I want to read you something from Matthew Henry's commentary. He says of these things, Our Lord knew all men, their nature, dispositions, affections, designs, so as we do not know any man. Here's what's interesting. Not even ourselves. He knows his crafty enemies and all their secret projects, his false friends and their true characters. He knows who are truly his, knows their uprightness and knows their weaknesses. He ends with saying, we know what is done by men. Christ knows what is in them. He tries the heart. Well, since we, and we all know we can't, read the hearts of men, then that behooves us to be exceedingly careful about when people do things, us being so sure, well, I know why I did it. Do you? We must approach those in opposition in carefulness, 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26. We must be sure that what we're dealing with is in fact the case. I've said in debate before, I don't want to misrepresent my opponent. And then I may state whatever I understand that I've researched his position is on this thing. And I usually would say something like this. Now, if I have not, if in saying what I said does not uh, cover exactly what he believes, I want him to stand up here and tell me where I went wrong because I don't want to misrepresent him. You don't want to do that. I don't know why we as children of light, meaning of truth, why we would want to misrepresent something, but sometimes people 
people do, and I've seen some of that over the years when it comes to getting so mad at one another in the church, they would bite a nail or two. We must approach brethren who are overtaking them in trespass with the desire to deal with them according to the trespass. Now, you know, when it says elders sin, it says you're to rebuke them before all. Yet when you go, go uh, and again, it would be the nature of the sin, how you deal with it, all other principles of the scriptures dealing with brethren brought to bear. But you look in the scriptures and you'll see things were done differently. Public matters were handled publicly. But private matters were handled that way. So showing proper consideration for the other person makes a difference. I remember one time long years ago in Van Buren, we were studying with some Jehovah's Witnesses. And there were several of them and several of us. We met in a man's house who was a Jehovah's Witness. Or at least they were studying with him and he wanted us to be there. He wasn't a Christian or Jehovah's Witness either one to use that term like they do. And I remember one of their men sitting there, and he had made a statement that was true. And I always try to look for truth in somebody, even if their general doctrine is false. I always try to look for truth so I can start there with them. And he had a buddy with him, and I was trying my best to agree with him. And he was so adamant since I, he knew we didn't believe what they believed, and while we were there, it was a mini debate in a man's living room, he wouldn't listen long enough to me to even realize what I was saying, and his buddy elbowed him two or three times and said, he's agreeing with you. And he looked kind of funny when he realized that he hadn't even listened to what I'd said. Well, we can all be guilty of that kind of thing. Unless the Lord said, take heed, watch you hear. And he also said, take heed how you hear it. Be sure it's the Word of God to be sure you're hearing it as the Word of God and you're hearing it properly. The immediate context offers reasons to answer carefully. Jesus possessed unlimited authority to judge man, proven by his resurrection from the dead that he was the only begotten Son of God. Jesus possessed divine power to read the hearts of men. As I pointed out earlier, we sometimes have trouble discerning our own hearts. You ever said something, well, I just can't make up my mind. I don't think Jesus ever had, I just can't make up my mind. I guarantee you, he never uttered those words. There are times for righteous indignation. I'm sorry that we live in an age that thinks that if you speak plainly, frankly, candidly, and raise your voice, that people immediately think, you're a wicked and vile somebody. I don't know where they learned to think that, but they would do well to remember this sermon and go back and realize they're jumping to a conclusion that's not warranted by the evidence at all when they do that. And there's a time when you want people to get the point. And even in a sermon, you raise your voice. Those of us who can. Some things must be left to the Lord. And the quicker we would learn that, a whole lot better off we would be as he is the righteous judge and infallible. We must avoid what might actually be self-righteous indignation. Now again, that gets very personal. And you'll notice most of us get upset because of what somebody does personally to us. I urge you to study everything there is about Christ and his life on this earth. And you will never find him getting angry at people because of their personal dealings with him. He was angry with them when he displayed it because of their violation of God's will. Now, I can't think if somebody's getting angry, why, what, what better thing to be upset about than here are people violating God's will, and if they keep on, where is it going to lead them? You can't live this life violating God's will and die in violation of God's will, and hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant on the day of judgment. You can't do it. That disturbs me. It disturbed me as a teenager, and that's one reason all these years I've tried to preach. That mean I didn't need to grow and to develop, and that I was going to be able to be a preacher and never make a mistake? Uh, certainly not. That is 
foolish to even think of such a thing, and I knew that a long time ago. But also thinking because I will make mistakes that I shouldn't try at all is a bigger mistake than anybody wants to make. Because nobody's ever tried to do anything right that they didn't make mistakes. But if you're of the right kind of disposition of mind, you'll recognize those mistakes and you will turn away from them. If you can tell me another way that you have grown spiritually, then I'd like to know it because I think sometimes we understand experience means we've floundered at times and we realize from it that we shouldn't have and we went the other direction because of what we've learned and that's how wisdom develops through years of trying to do what we know the Bible says. The greatest mistake anybody will ever make is to know what's right. But because you think of your humanity and the weaknesses of it, say, well, I'm not going to start that. I can't live it flawlessly. So I just won't even try. I no greater mistakes have ever been made than that one. No greater sin. So while we may not always be able to emulate the Lord's prerogative to judge, we certainly strive to copy His zeal for His Father's house according to the authority that he's revealed in his last will and testament. If that's not the case, then you just ignore this sermon because it can't be right. <laughs> if you're a child of God, that's a wonderful thing. But because we do make mistakes, you may have sinned and need to repent of them. If it's privately done, take care of it there. If it's public, then confess it before the brethren and ask God for forgiveness as they pray with you and for you. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, we know what the Bible requires of us to become a Christian. There's only one way to do that. And now we're going to offer this invitation, encouraging people by the song and by this invitation at the end of the sermon to do what they need to do to make their life right with God as we stand and as we sing.